was still in college between my junior and senior years. I'd been working in Boston that summer driving a cab and I bought a small motor scooter to get around Boston and I drove that, rode that motor scooter 400 miles from, from Boston to, to Washington for the march. So that's how I got there, <laughs> which was an experience in itself. Um, not so much, you know, the first 300 miles, but um, the dawn of the morning of the march, my scooter couldn't make the speed limit, so I was on the shoulder and traffic was passing me. But increasingly from dawn on, there was bus after bus, and they became more and more solid, more and more buses passing me, and with banners on the side. And I had this incredible sense of this, this movement, this flow to Washington with a, a common purpose, which was incredibly exciting. What was the common purpose for you? Why'd you go? Well, I had, uh, I developed, you know, progressive politics in, uh, in my college years, even though I went to a small liberal arts college in Ohio, there wasn't a whole lot of political activity. Uh, I'd been part of a couple of uh, pickets down at the Woolworth store in favor of the Freedom Riders, but um, there wasn't much opportunity to be involved. But I knew in, that this was an, Im an immensely important event that was about to happen, and an historic event, and I had to be there. Had tell, to be a part of it. <laughs> tell me about that day. What happened? How'd you feel? Uh, it was an amazing experience. It was, first of all, just the experience of the crowd. Uh, this was the largest crowd I had ever been a part of. In fact, it was the largest uh, crowd in Washington ever. Uh, I think the uh, previously the largest crowd had been a Ku Klux Klan rally in, in the mid-1930s. So having between 250 and 300,000 people all in the same place at the same time was just a powerful, moving experience with a sense that you know, all of us had a common purpose, um, that we were together in order to make history and to make change in our society. And there was a joy and an optimism because of, of that mass. Um, the spe speeches certainly you know, rev people up, but I think uh, for most people it was the experience of being there and the sense of, of solidarity that we had in a common purpose that was really the most important. What moved you most that day? Well, it was, it was a combination of all those things. It was a combination of, of the sense of being part of a much larger movement uh, and, again, the optimism that we, that we could make history, that we were making history in the march and that we could continue to make history after the march was over. The speeches were inspiring, and that always is, uh, is important in your life, to be inspired by a cause. And the sense that we were there for the purposes of justice and freedom, um, again, all united in a common purpose was the overriding experience that I had that I'll never forget. You haven't talked about economic empowerment or, ep or economic equality yet. Talk about that. Well, one thing I didn't realize until I actually got to the march was the role that labor was playing in the march. And that became an important part of it for me. Uh, the UAW was especially prominent, a lot of UAW signs, a sprinkling of other union signs. And also the diversity of the crowd, that there was 20, 25 percent white folks at the march, uh, a lot of students. But the labor presence was something that surprised me and something that I remembered. And when I first became a union member seven years later, uh, I, that experience was reawakened, that, um, that alliance between the civil rights movement and, and labor. In the meantime, I had been teaching in Alabama at Tuskegee Institute between 65 and 68 working with a civil rights movement, primarily SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, 
so I had a certainly a good grounding in the civil rights movement but then when I first came to Madison and after a couple of years got a teaching assistant position and joined the union um, had a sense once again of uniting those two movements that had a common purpose for justice. Do you think that the economic empowerment part of the march has gotten lost in history? Absolutely, absolutely, um, and as well as the labor role, um, which is unfortunate. It's un unfortunate, I think, for all of us. Give me that again in a complete sentence you think has gotten lost, and, and tell me why. I think it has gotten lost, and in part because Martin Luther King and his speech came to dominate uh, people's memories of the march, uh, and rightfully so. I mean, that was a powerful conclusion to that rally. And none of us realized it at the time, but extemporaneous, that it was not part of his planned speech. Uh, in fact, I guess he went far beyond his allotted time uh, on the podium. But um, because of the, the power of that speech and the fact that the media and certainly many of the participants, that's what they remembered in terms of the speeches themselves. So the fact that this was a march for jobs and freedom got lost. It became a Martin Luther King march. And we're seeing that again, I think, in this 50th commemoration of the march, that it's become almost exclusively a civil rights uh, commemoration and with a focus on Dr. King and labor and the jobs, economic dimension of that march has been lost as a result. Is it, is it, why is it important to remember that, especially in light of what's going on today? Because the alliance between the civil rights movement uh, and, and labor can be such a powerful one. Um, both movements do not have the power that they had back in the early 60s, but still combined, um, we can be a very, very powerful force. And again, that's what motivated me in, in my union work and trying to bring together again that alliance between civil rights and labor uh, in the cause of justice, social and economic justice, equal rights, and that's what I've been trying to do ever since. Well, tell me very specifically some of the things you've done. After you got out, after you left Tuskegee and when you came into Wisconsin, what did you do here? Well, uh, I was a graduate student in history and uh, became active in the union. I was first a member in 1970. Um, I was gone uh, for a couple of years doing research, came back in 1973. And it was at that time that our union, the Teaching Assistance Association, first um, joined an international AFL-CIO union, the American Federation of Teachers. And I had been, become a steward in the history department, went to my first stewards council meeting, and there was a call for people to volunteer to be delegates to the local labor council here in Madison, which is now the South Central Federation of Labor. And I didn't think of it at the time, I don't think, but my hunch is that my experience with the March on Washington had an influence on my raising my hand and saying, yeah, I want to be a delegate. Now that organization, that council was very, very conservative at the time. And so we began slowly but methodically to build a progressive caucus within the council, and, which was successful. And in fact, I was elected president of that organization in 1982. And then later, uh, four years later, elected secretary treasurer of the state FLCIO, and then eight years later, president. But always running on a progressive slate, a slate uh, in which we emphasize that the purpose of unions and the purpose of the FLCIO was not simply bread and butter issues of, of wages and benefits, but it was that larger cause of social and economic justice. And I think we're getting back to that, certainly, in the labor movement. It's been growing over the last 10, 15 years, and it's such an important thing for the labor movement to recapture, because if we're only looking at our own membership, we're not serving the working class, we're not serving that broader cause of social and economic justice. And we can still, even with 
diminished numbers and resources, we still can be a powerful force for those causes. What does history, what has history gotten right about the march? Uh, that's a very difficult question for me to answer because, again, people refer to it in simply iconic terms of Martin Luther King's speech, and there's very little discussion about the background, about its importance, its continuing importance after the march. And it's also, it's uh, bringing together the civil rights movement, but uh, not really recognizing for the general public a lot of the inner conflicts uh, within the civil rights movement, within the labor movement. And the amazing thing in a way is that, that it happened at all and that those various organizations uh, could come together for such a massive undertaking that had such an incredible impact on this country, its politics and its ideals. 50 years later, what is it that the world needs to remember about the march in order to move forward and be better? I think it's that people organized can make a difference. I mean, we tend to think uh, too, far too much today in terms of uh, electoral politics, of electing the right politicians, and not nearly enough of a sense of having power outside of electoral politics that's putting pressure on, po on politicians to do the right thing. We need to recreate that. And unless we recreate that sense of, of people in motion, of people united, uh, with a goal pressuring our elected officials to do the right thing, then we're not going to make the gains that we need to make. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you wanted to talk about? Um, I guess going back to the experience of the march itself, and I think I've said this perhaps, but um, the mood of that crowd was absolutely inspiring. The sense of joy, the sense of hope, uh, of optimism, of expectation, and again this, the sense of being part of this huge movement that most people did not have a sense of. You couldn't have a sense of it unless you got that many people together in the same place and you began to feel the power of what we had created and what we could take forward.